Uh, before we like, dive in and everything, go ahead and turn your, your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17. Um, <clears throat> the reason why we did patriotic songs this morning, uh, it may not seem normal in a during church service, but let me share with you all. Um, this great country was founded on God. Amen, brother. It was founded on biblical scriptures. So when those patriotic songs were written, they had God in mind. Yeah. And so we had to get back to those roots of our very foundation in this country anyway. So when we sing these patriotic songs, not only are we having pride in our country, but more so we are being reminded that this very country was founded on God and His Word. So I just want to kind of reiterate that. Uh, another thing, again, I apologize for the, the TVs being off today, the screens. Um, the, t the computer got fried this morning. Uh, literally, I was plugging in the HDMI cable, and a fireball came flying back out at me. So, uh, praise God for his protection. It, it is as fried. It's gone. So, uh, but anyway, it's, it's been kind of a, a week, especially with technical difficulties. Our, our phone is out here at the church. I don't know what's going on with that. I'm working on that, but... Uh, still waiting for that, and then I, I get this morning. I put my jacket on and find out that uh, uh, it shrunk. <laughs> you know, no, mostly like through here, but it has shrunk. So I'm, I'm just having a week. But praise God, because of my perspective, I know that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He still sits on the throne. Amen. Amen. And that's how we got to look at our, our circumstances, guys. Knowing that no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what we are facing, we know that God is is in control of everything. Everything is in His, his hands. And we've got to know that His Word is still going to come to pass in our life. So it goes back to, are you speaking the Word of God over your life? If you are speaking the Word of God over your life, you're speaking power, you're speaking authority, and you're welcoming God's uh, 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 provision, you're, weak, you're welcoming His healing inside your life. So again, talk about perspectives this morning. Make sure you understand that no matter what situation that you are facing, that you're seeing it from God's perspective. He's been kind of hitting me with a couple of things this morning I want to just ask real quick. Do you see a difficulty in every situation or do you see an opportunity in every difficulty? Amen. And I, I'm tuning on that one this morning. That's good. And another thing is, do uh, rose bushes have thorns? Or do thorn bushes have roses? It's all about perspective. You see, we got to look at the roses in our lives. we got to stop and smell the roses, amen? And, and sometimes you're going to get pricked by, by that <laughs> rose bush. But you know what? Praise God for the beauty in it. Because, can I tell you, with a little bit of pain comes victory. Jesus had to go through a lot of pain to bring victory in his life. Amen. The question for us, so how much pain are we willing to go through to receive the victory that God has for each and every one of us? And we keep on thinking because, you know, we have Jesus now in our lives that things should be, you know, butterflies and marshmallows. It's not always sweet. Life is not always sweet. But I always say this, I would much rather go through this life with Jesus than without him. So, again, as we talk about perspectives this morning, we're going to be back, of course, in 1 Samuel 17, talking about the, uh, the life of David as he is meeting Goliath for the first time. And, and we've been talking about perspectives here lately, and we started talking about, about, about his character, how his character has influenced his perspective. And it's very important that we have a good character about ourselves because it will directly influence our perspective on things. And so we're going to see, again... Uh, a different type of perspective or something else that influences perspective. So 1 Samuel 17 and look at verse 28. 1 Samuel 17 and let's look at verse 28. It says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, the, the, the thing that uh, influences perspective this morning I want to look at is our history of someone. 
Because can I tell you, your history with someone can greatly influence your perspective of them. So, you know, especially as we apply, I try to do everything applied to our lives and to the church. So let's say that you have history with someone. And, and you haven't seen it for a long time. And also they, they come through the doors of the church. And, and then when they come through the doors of the church, depending on your history with that person will, will determine your perspective on that person. Amen? So you see this person come in. And maybe you've dealt with them through addictions and, and all this and that. So, and you see them come in and out of church all the time. So here they come through the door and immediately, because of your history with this person, you begin to think, well, how long is this going to last? Are, are they really sober this time? Uh, are they really walking with the Lord? You see, because of your history with that person, it will greatly influence your perspective on that person. But this is the key, though. Let's say that person comes back through the doors and they have like just been sold out on God. Just completely just on fire for him, right? Ready to just get, get sent to Africa that God sends them to. They just so on fire, just flowing in the gifts of his spirit, right? This is my question. Who is it that has changed? And who is it that's still the same? You see, again, you can tell a lot about your own perspective, Based on your character. And you can tell a lot about your character based on your own perspective. You see, if you continue to look at the same person over and over and over, and over again in the same way, guess what? You're not changing. There's no change in you whatsoever. The way we should look at one another is in Christ's eyes. No matter what is going on in their lives, guess what? This is a key. Listen. That's between them and God. The struggles that they face. The challenges that they go through, the stumbling blocks that keep them tripping up, guess what? That is not between you and them. This is between them and God. What you need to do is look at that person and know that they are a child of the Most High God. Yeah, they may have struggles. Who doesn't have struggles? Amen? That's right. We all have a history. We all have struggles. And we got to begin to look at one another in Christ's eyes, knowing that, you know what? He died for them. Maybe get a little compassion stirred up in our hearts this morning for one another. Know that, you know what? Instead of looking at that person coming back through, or, or maybe you meet them on the sidewalk, maybe you go to Walmart and see them there. Instead of having that same mindset, go, you know what? I'm going to step out and help this person now. Because, you know what? I've gone through it. You know what? I have a history. I have a very black history. But you know what? It's covered with red. Because it's covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. If he was able to help someone like me through my situation, praise God, I know I can help them as well. Because he can help them, help them through me. So again, it's all about history too this morning as we're going to see. You've got to understand something. I just keep on feeling like hitting this. The history between you and the person should be covered by the blood of Jesus. Because of your prayers. Mm -hmm. Again, we as human beings... Hold on to history. I mean, I'm trying not to step into it, but I got to. Isn't that what's going on in this country today? Just holding on to history. When in all actuality, shouldn't be looking to what's ahead. Isn't that what the Word of God tells us? Don't look behind. The Word of God says, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven if you lay your hands to the plow and look behind. Why? Because you're going to keep on going to surface. But what the Word of God tells us to do is look ahead. Look at what's coming. Don't look at the troubles now. Get that perspective about you. Don't look at your troubles now. Look ahead. Because guess what? Something is coming. Or should I say someone is coming. Amen. Jesus Christ is about to step back down on this earth. Amen. Shouldn't the church be excited during this time right now? Yes. But why are we like, like a little chihuahua during a thunderstorm? We're just shaking in fear. Why? Jesus Christ is on the return, guys. Shouldn't that get us a little excited? Amen. Shouldn't that fire us up a little bit? Amen. Every every holiday now, I'm trying to celebrate it like it's my last one. <laughs> you know? Yesterday was my last 4th of July. Praise the Lord. Because I'm about to celebrate a whole other level of independence. Amen? <laughs> independence from my flesh. Independence from sin. Independence this world as I step into the glory of God. That is what my perspective is and that is what each and every one of our perspectives should be as well. Mm. Aren't we excited? See? Praise God. 
So let's look at a couple things in verse 28 that, that we need to understand. Again, we're talking about Eliab, we're talking about his, his brother David, right? And, and we see this disdain just in verse 28, how he talks to David. You know, what are you doing here? Are you supposed to be shepherding a few sheep? We'll look at that in a minute. So what's their history together? There must be some type of history to cause a brother to have so much disdain for his other brother. But isn't that what we see in today's society? So much disdain in households. So much disdain in communities. I mean, there's so much disdain amongst family. Uh, so look at back. 1 Samuel 16. <clears throat> I want to still look at something. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I want to look at this history between Eliab and David. <clears throat> Why does Eliab look so disrespectful towards David? What, what did David do to him? Anything? So, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. I don't know if I said that right or not. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. So it was, when they came, that he looked at Eliab, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now, what we're talking about here is when Samuel was sent by God to go anoint one of Jesse's sons. He didn't know which one. Only thing he knew that he was on the course that God had him on. And Samuel knew that God told me to go anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king over Israel. So, again, verse 6. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, Samuel did, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. You just stop there for a moment. So, the reason why Eliab was so just, uh, towards David because the Lord did not choose Eliab. Now, remember, David at this time when he was being anointed as king was between the age of 10 and 13. He was a lot younger than what Jezreel is right now. A lot younger than Jezreel between the ages of 10 and 13. And we know that there were seven brothers in between them, right? So at the very youngest, Eliab would have been 17. But it's believed that he is probably a lot, young, a lot older than David even in seven years. He could have been up to 24 years. We don't know what actual age group he was. But the key is this. Eliab was probably pretty ticked off at David because he felt like that. Here he is. He's the firstborn. He had a birthright. He had a right to the blessings. But here's the, the young one, David. Getting sent by the prophet Samuel, by God himself, to anoint him and become king. What do you think that did to Eliab? Jealousy. Oh, jealousy at the worst, right? So much jealousy. Jealousy and competition has killed the church, guys. Yeah. We no longer want to help one another in their giftings and callings with the Lord because we're afraid that we're going to get replaced by, you know what? If someone wants to come up here and take the pulpit, <laughs> praise the Lord! You know what I'm saying? And again, in the military, brother, am I right? In the military, we had to raise people up in our place in case we got taken out. Am I right? Yes. Do you think the kingdom of heaven is different? God is constantly calling us and sending us, calling us and sending us. We have got to be as, as true disciples of Christ, raising up other disciples under us so that way they can take our place when God calls us to go somewhere else. Ugh, get this. You know how promotions work in kingdom? This is how the promotions work in kingdom. Without jealousy, and without competition. In order for you to get promoted, you've got to have someone take your place. And you cannot let someone else get a promotion until you get out of their upcoming place. Perspective. 
It's all about perspective this morning. So here it is. Eliab is so disdained towards David because he got anointed king at the age of 10 or 13. And he was left behind. He was forgotten about. And so it... I'm jump ahead of myself. So he's probably thinking on the battle lines right now, like, what am I even doing here? Oh, there it is. That's fine. Maybe he was thinking, you know, God forsook me. What am I even fighting for him for? I got a Goliath standing in front of me. And, and he expects me to fight for him when he wouldn't even fight for me. A lot of Christians feel that. Because the situation did not go correct or how they thought it would go in their lives. And they felt left behind by God. They felt forgotten or forsaken by God because their prayer did not go the way they expected it to go. Look, I'll, I'll speak the truth, guys. I'll tell you, probably 97% of our prayers will never go the way you pray for it. Never. And praise God for that, right? Because his ways are above our ways, his thoughts higher than ours. He sees the whole picture. We see this little thing right here, perspective. He sees everything. We see this little tiny thing. It's even thought that maybe David even came from uh, a, a birth of adult, birth that resulted from adultery because of Psalm 51. Now, that's not for sure. They don't really know for sure. But a couple of things that David speaks of in the Psalms make, make the commentators think that maybe. Uh, David was, was birthed from adultery, so they already had this disdain towards him anyway. You know, let me, let me share something with you. The more God disqualifies, I'm sorry, the more people disqualify you, the more qualified you are in God's eyes. Let me, let me say that again. The more that man disqualifies you, the more qualified you are in God's eyes. I mean, let's face it. Six, six, seven years, yeah, six years ago, when I came behind this pulpit the first time, I was not qualified. According to man's qualifications, I was not qualified. I had no theology school. I never went to seminary. I had a psychology degree. But God had a plan. And we stepped out in faith and, and took on that plan, amen? And we did it all together. It wasn't just one man. We all did together for the good of the kingdom of heaven. And, and can I tell you, don't disqualify yourself because of what man decides you should be able to do. Because it's not about man. It's all about God. Perspective, guys. Again, perspective. Again, we look at one another. Look at it from God's perspective. You'll see so much more talent in that person than you will ever see through your own eyes. Praise God. Again, perspective. We're not here amongst friends. We're here amongst family. Amen. Isn't that what the church body is supposed to be about? Not friends. It's family. We, are we all saved in here today? Amen. Then aren't we bleeding the same blood? Amen. And that's the blood of Christ that was shed for each and every one of us. That's what makes us a brother and sisterhood. That's what makes us family. So, again, his anger was so aroused that David, not then, not, not in verse 28, it happened back when Samuel anointed David. That's when the anger was stirred up. Not just right here. This was the fruit of what had already been seeded a while ago, when Samuel came and anointed David for the calling that God placed on his life. And so here's, here's Eliab, so mad, so just disgruntled, and, and he goes and he says, back in 1 Samuel 17, 28, he goes, why didn't you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I really feel God. Turn with me one more time. We'll come back here. Turn with me one more time. I just really feel this. Uh, 1 Timothy 4. Just be led by the Lord this morning. So we talk about Eliab. Of course, he, he looks at David as probably disqualified. At this point in the story with, with Goliath, 
it's believed that David's probably 15 to 17 years old now. More likely 15. The, the same age as Jezreel right now is what David is. And here's this warrior, Eliad, the oldest, looking at Jezreel going, what are you doing here? What is a shepherd boy doing out of a, a war? What is a shepherd boy doing out of a fight? You see, Eliad was so caught up in himself, he never got to see, oh, he never got to see God move in David's life. He probably never heard of the story of how David slayed the bear and the lion. You thought about being qualified? What's Eliab done in all of his life? Shook on the battle scene? But here's David qualified because of the faith that he walks and the trust that he has in his God and in God's word. That is what has qualified him. His faith in, in, in the word. Look at 1 Timothy 4. And look at verse 12. And again, you know, we talked about this, I think it was last Sunday or last Wednesday night. And I keep on saying, no, well, the, the Word of God wasn't written during this time with, with David. But the thing is, is this. The Word of God was when? In the beginning was the Word. The Word of God was always around. Just because we don't, just because they might not have it in hand back then, is what we call the spoken Word of God. I, I guarantee it, guys. I guarantee it that God spoke this. To David at this point. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers <laughs> in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. This is what God is speaking to the church today. I never noticed that before. One word is spoke out to me. Let yourself be an example. To the heathens, right? Amen. That what it says? No. To the believers. To the believers. <laughs> to the church. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're not talking about the lost, guys. We're not talking about the unsaved. We're not talking about the wicked. We're talking about the believers. The believers in Christ. Again, let no one despise you, but be an example to those who call themselves Christians. To the believers. How? In word. When I look at the word word this morning in Greek, it means something spoken from the heart. You will know a lot about a person from, from the basis or the foundation of how they speak. You will know a lot about them. What drives them to speak? I got a word coming Wednesday night about our words. We, we kind of touched base Wednesday night, but seriously, I mean, what are we speaking the Lord gave me a vision a couple of weeks ago about being in the throne room of God. And we know our the prayers of the saints are like incense, right? And he asked me, son, because of, of our communication together, of our relationship together, because of your prayers, what does the prayer, what does the throne room look like after you get done visiting with me? Is it full of incense and smoke? Or is there just a slight haze? You see, you got to understand something, guys. Before I can bring a word, i got to get taken behind the tool shed and get whooped a little bit. Because it has spoke to me first, and then i got to bring it. you got to understand that when I'm talking about perspective, God has had to take me behind the tool shed and change my perspective on things so I could come out and bring forth this message. That's the only way it can happen. And so again, the, the believers in word and, and what you speak... In conduct. In KJV, I think it says conversation. And that's exactly what it is. Conversation and conduct. How do you behave? You know a lot about a person, number one, how they speak. You know a lot about how they behave. I talked about a couple of weeks ago about perspectives and reactions. And this morning, I wanted to lose my mind when the computer got fried. But I was like, that's when I heard the Lord. Do you see a difficulty in every situation? Or do you see an opportunity in every difficulty? So I was like, all right, I've got to see from his perspective. Maybe he was tired of using that computer and wants a new one. I don't know. Everything's God's. Amen. In word, in conduct, in love. Remember, love is not something that can be conjured up inside of you. We have newlyweds amongst us this morning. Do you think that? They have a love that just conjured up for one another. 
We, we got two of them right now, about to be newlyweds next Saturday. Love is in the air. <laughs> Amen. But this is the key. It's not because they're trying to conjure up love between one another. First John 4 says God is love. God is creator. So love can never be created. It can only flow through us from God. When two people love each other, it's a love of God. It's not a love that we can just, I'm going to try to love you. You can't try to love someone. It, it, love is of God because love is God. Are we doing that today? Are we doing that in today's society? It's easy for me to love Jordan. I love him as my brother. I die for that man. I'll die for all of y'all. But I love my brother. I love my sister. But how about going out to one of these houses here that I know has just pulled my name in the mud? How easy is it to love them? How easy is it to show them Christ? Again, brother, back in the military. Ooh, I know we have some sergeants. He did not even like, right? I so wish I was saved when I was in the Air Force. I so wish I was saved back then. There's so much more opportunity I could have seen now. But again, how do we love one another? The only way is through Christ. It's in Christ's love. Again, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Without, without Christ, you cannot truly love. The scripture in spirit how we how we show God by our spirit and, and by the way the spirit in Greek is actually towards the Trinity spirit in other words the Holy Spirit are you flowing in the spirit or in the flesh are we loving each other as we walk in the spirit or are we tending to walk on the line and cross over the flesh every now and then? It's easy to get in the flesh. Isn't it? You see, the way that, that you can love one another in spirit is by already walking in the spirit. So, we, so when, when things happen in our lives, we, we don't get offended. Again, Jesus said, look, in these end times, there's going to be a lot of offenses. Remember, I know I repeated it, but remember, offense is an event. To become offended is your choice. The way you become offended is by being in the flesh and not the spirit. Because there's no offense in the spirit. Amen? Right. In faith, what kind of faith are you showing another believer? Do you have people in your life going, man, I would just love to have the faith that they have. Is that the person that, are you the one that people are talking about going, I love the faith that she walks in. That, that no matter what is going on in their lives, they continue to smile. In that, have you ever been around someone like that? I, I won't say his name on, on the video, but you know who I'm talking about. We talk about him often. At the end of his life, we all were getting encouraged by that man. You would have a bad day and go on the, on the side of his deathbed to get encouraged. I hope I have that much faith. I hope that one day I have that much faith to know and have that perspective that I'm not on my deathbed. I'm standing at the threshold of heaven. Glory. 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 Finally, purity. One of the, probably the, the biggest ones in this little set of scriptures right here. Are we walking in purity? In other words, consecration. You know, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them, be separated, says the Lord. He wants us to walk at a life of purity, a life of consecration. Again, we don't need t-shirts that says, hi, I'm a Christian. You should be able to recognize it. Sunday nights, we're talking about Acts 5. You know, in Acts 4, we just talked about where it said that they knew that these men had been sitting with the Lord. They knew that these disciples were with Jesus. Why? Because they were uneducated and untrained men. I want people to know that I spend time with my God. 
Not because I've got to wear the shirt, but, but because they see the glory of God on my life. Are we, are we reflections? Miss Evelyn brought that to me last week. You know, sometimes we've got to be called the moon. Can you say that again? Because we're supposed to be reflecting the sun. Because we're supposed to be reflecting the sun. Sometimes he calls us to go into a dark place to reflect the sun's light. Reflect the sun's glory. Praise God for that. So let's finish it up. This is my last. So, look at verse 29. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was there. Look at verse 28 again. So at first he says, why did you come down here? And then he goes, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Two stabs in one sentence right here. Number one, he's like, you're just a shepherd boy. You come to fight being a shepherd. Don't let no one talk down to you. The only way you can allow someone to talk down to you is when you forget who you are in Christ. When you forget your identity, then you allow anyone to talk down to you. But here's David. He's like, I know my God. Remember, he was known as a man after God's own heart. And, and, and number one, he wasn't just a shepherd. He's a man of God. He's a child of the Most High God. He's a warrior in the Spirit. But number two, Eli was like those few sheep. In other words, you can only be trusted with very few. Not only are you a shepherd, but you're not very good at it because you can't only be trusted with just a very few amount of sheep. Imagine if David did not know who he was in God at this point. This story about David and Goliath would turn out so differently. And can I tell you, in each and every one of our lives, there were some points that our stories turned out so differently than what God had because we listen to man and not God. Amen. So let's finish it up. Verse 29. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he keeps coming back. And I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Insolence in Hebrew means arrogance and wickedness. And, and the reason why I want to come back here is before I, I finish my last thought in verse 29, hear this because the Lord gave me two Two different bullets, if you will, on this particular thing. He said, confidence can seem prideful and arrogant to timid and fearing people. Your boldness will look like cockiness to those who are timid. And refer back to verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Who is involved with all the men here in verse 24? Iliad. He falls in the category of all. He was so dreadfully afraid that he left the situation. We talked about that before. I'm not going to go back onto it. How many times have we been MIA, missing in action because of the fear that has come upon us? But here is Iliad, disdaining David. And it goes back, he's looking at him. He's seeing him as cocky and arrogant, wicked. You know how many times, oh, I won't get on that parade. But look, we're, in a, we're living in a time right now that people are going to have to see you as cocky. They're going to have to see you as not timid. They're going to have to see you like Stephen. And stand for Christ. Amen. Are you willing to stand for Christ until the death? You don't think that's coming to this country? Can I tell you it's already here? Do you know in California right now, the governor does not want anybody to worship in song because they might spread the coronavirus? Even worship is being stolen away from God's people. And we have the audacity to come and go, I don't like this song. So finally, verse 29. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? What have I done now? It's like David, it's like this same scenario plays in David's life. What have I done now? Where did I go wrong again in your eyes? Some people, you will, thank you, Lord. 
There's some people you would never make happy. There are some people in your life you will never please. No matter how much you try, you will never please them. But you want to know how to please God? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He would love me six. That's it. God just wants to see some faith in us. But here he is. What is your cause? And other David's like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're a warrior in God's army. What is your cause? What are you doing here? David's actually reminding his brother as a warrior, what are you doing here? This is what God is asking each and every one of us as we close this thing. What are you doing? What is your cause? What are you doing here? What are you standing for? What do you have faith in? Why are you serving the kingdom of heaven? It's assuming because it's got great benefits. Yeah. Faith and duty, right? Again, if you are following Christ because of the things he can do for you, you missed it. That's what the multitude did. They continued following him. Wow. That's what the difference, guys, between a worshiper of Christ and a follower of Christ is. A follower of Christ will continue to follow Christ because of the things that Christ can do for them. And they continue to follow because they think there's something else that God will give them. A worshiper of Christ will follow Christ even if he doesn't do anything else for them. Amen. Because of who God is and not because of what he can do for them. So that's our question right now as we close. Why are you where you are today? Eliab was on the battlefield. Completely forgot why. Each and every one of us is on a spiritual battlefield right now. Why? Eliab completely forgot that that Goliath that stood before him with the Philistine army had no right to be there in the first place. In fact, God said that they're going to be there. But you know what? You're to remove them. That's your land. Can I tell you that God is waiting on each and every one of us to claim our land still? He's been, I've told you all before, but I'm telling you the, the fist right here. You know how many things I've been praying for that God said, why you already have it? Or why are you praying for the things I told you to go ahead and do long ago? Expect me to do it, but he expects me to do it. There's a lot of things, guys, we ask God to do for us when we have the power and authority from Him to do it ourselves. So, a final thought. Perspectives. What's your perspective of the story this morning? See, when we read the Word of God, we're supposed to put ourselves there at the battle scene. Where do you find yourself on the battle scene this morning? Are you standing, are you standing beside Eliot? being fearfully and dreadfully afraid because of what your perspective on things are? Or are you standing with David knowing that it doesn't matter how big your situation is, your God is bigger? Amen? Let's tweak our perspectives this morning, guys. And throughout this next week, allow God to do such a mighty work in your mind and your heart to bring your perspective back from His perspective. Because when you're seated in Christ, you're seated high above all principalities of power and darkness, according to the Word of God. You're seated above the enemy and above your situations. In other words, you already have the victory of your situation before it even arises in your life. Let's pray, Father. Lord, your glory is God. Oh, praise God. Praise Jesus. Praise Holy Spirit. Lord, we just... I offer you praise, glory, and thanksgiving, God. We thank you for the message this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, that you trust us more than we trust ourselves, God. Lord, give us a perspective, God, from your advantage point, God. Give us a perspective, God, of how we are already victorious in Christ, Lord. No matter what situation arises, God, we already have the victory at hand, God. Not because of what we have done, God, but because of what you have already done, God, for you said it is finished. 
Lord, I thank you, Father, right now for your glory that rests upon each and every one of our lives, God. We so greatly desire, Lord, to be like the disciples of old, that everyone would know that we have been with Jesus because of the glory that rests upon each and every one of us, God. So, Lord, today we bless your holy name. Again, Lord, we thank you for the independence in our lives, the freedom that we have in Christ, God. We love you. God, I bless everyone here today, God. And we bless your name, Lord. We love you. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' sweet, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.